Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the sixth season of Artwork, a series in which innovative artists come to Lang to talk about the artistic process. I'm Bonnie Maranka, the curator of this series and a Lang theater faculty professor. Tonight, our guest is the theater director and visual artist, Theodora Skipitaris, who has been working in New York and around the world for more than three decades. She's the first of our artists in this series to be working with puppets, and I'm sure you will enjoy hearing what she has to say about this special kind of performance. Theodora Skipitaris, like many of the artists who come, who come to Lang in this series, works in multiple art forms. She trained as a sculptor and theater designer from the start, combining her interests in the visual arts and in performing arts. It is interesting to note how many artists working today in performance and video began their work as sculptors. This grounding gradually evolved in Theodora's work toward puppetry, and she is one of New York's best known artists working in this field today. In a recent text of hers that I asked her to contribute to a journal that I edit, she wrote, and here I'm quoting, the text in my performance always comes from the objects. I began making solo performances strongly influenced by the vibrant scene of visual performance art in Soho in the mid-70s. My performances featured handmade objects that were attached to a true story or a fragment of a story and had a connection to my body. Along the way, I began to make realistic representations of myself, about one-third life-size. These figures, which I called little Theodoras, started to take over the performance space, and soon I left the stage to become their director. What I didn't realize immediately was that I had stumbled onto a kind of puppet performance. Created by this evening's guests, there have been so many works over the years that encompass the broad range of historical, social, scientific, and political issues. They often combine life-size figures in works that include video, music, film, and text, in addition to live performers and puppets. One of her pieces, The Age of Invention, featured 300 puppets in an exploration of American inventions. Another work, Under the Knife, was a site-specific piece on the history of medicine. Leading the La Mama office, and I recall being one of them, the La Mama audience, and I recall being one of them, to 12 different environments in the theater. Optic fever brought her to a study of Renaissance artists and a new way of seeing. Think of the phrase, a new way of seeing. That is what experimental artists are all about, taking the entire world of knowledge as a field of discovery, exploring new ways of perceiving time and space, not knowing what you will find, but carrying on. Theodora Skipitaris doesn't limit her travels to the Western world by any means. Her curiosity and deep studies took her to Asia, the home of ancient forms of puppetry and the classics. She went to Cambodia and India, returning only recently from India as a Fulbright Fellow. India may be a unique example of the interaction between traditional and modern forms, she recently wrote. She herself is an artist who is, at, who is at home in the classics. The Iraq War precipitated a trilogy of works about the Trojan War. Her work with the Greek classics, drawing on her own cultural heritage and that of the great plays in the theatrical repertoire, continues to serve as a font of world wisdom for her artistic process. The interest in classics is a strong line of thought among contemporary artists which reveals how important it is to have a foundation in the classics. What T.S. Eliot called, quote unquote, the pastness in the present, is now updated in the words of the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben, who writes, and here I'm quoting, the contemporary is the one who, dividing and interpolating time, is capable of transforming it and putting it in relation to other times, end quote. In being an artist for all time, Theodore Skipitaris is an artist for our time. I am very pleased to have her with us tonight, and I hope you will join me in welcoming her. Uh, 
Thank you so much, Bonnie. You really um, kind of prefigured a lot of things that I'm going to talk about. in New York and everywhere else that are hybrid artists. Um, I know that how I wouldn't have become what I became if I hadn't arrived here in New York when I did, which was the early 70s. And I feel that in my case, geography really was my destiny. Um, I call uh, this next image autogeography, because what it is, it's um, a map of really my life when I first came to New York and what happened to me as a result of geography. So um, if you look at the magenta dot at the top, that was NYU where I came to study. And then my first apartment was on 4th between A and B. And then actually, my world even got smaller because I finally moved to a loft on 3rd and Bowery, and that's where I've been for more than 30 years. Um, but what happened was that um, when I went to NYU, I went to study stage design and film. And at that time, um, if you were um, a costume designer or set designer, you were working in a very strict hierarchy where the director was the god, and then you would feed ideas to the director, and it was usually a he, and if he approved, then your ideas were go, you know? But if um, you had, if you had extraordinary ideas and they didn't meet the approval of the director, you pretty much weren't gonna get to work much. So um, actually, it was frustrating for me to be at NYU. So um, what I would do is I would finish my classes at NYU at 6 p.m. And then I would walk downtown for about five minutes. And there was this whole new scene happening in Soho, which um, appealed to me very much. For one thing, you could go down to Soho any night, and you could walk into these industrial storefronts and you would find an incredibly open atmosphere, and you would see someone like Trisha Brown um, dancing with a scientist. You would see Philip Glass and Meredith Monk performing together, Laurie Anderson trying out her violin pieces, and so on. So I came to call this whole area my night school. So I was getting another education there, which in the end turned out to be so so meaningful for me. And a lot of these spaces are still well-known spaces. Some of them have moved, but you had the Paula Cooper Gallery, you had Artist Space, you had Robert Wilson's studio, you had 112 Green Street, you had, um, oh, the Worcester Group. Well, they weren't the Worcester Group yet, but they had the Performing Garage, and they still do, 55 Mercer Street, and the Kitchen. So it was kind of an amazing scene. And I really think that because of the openness in the, in the air about trying out new things, I was really emboldened to kind of leave my very short career in theater design. It lasted about six months after I finished school. Um, and I got a loft, which was very affordable because lofts were affordable. And I began to just work on my own. And inspired by these experiments that I saw, I began to try to find my way. Um, that meant, um, I think it's always important to know how an artist makes a living. That meant um, agreeing to have a job, like a waitress job, for quite a long time, uh, and just have the freedom to do um, the kind of work you wanted to do. 
So those artists that I went to see every couple of nights or every other night were important for two reasons. They were um, so open to new people and new ideas. And also, they really made crossing between disciplines very fluid. And now it's kind of a given, but at the time, it was a fantastically freeing kind of experience. So um, I started making um, performances with objects I had made. And this was the first performance I ever did. And it was in a gallery. It was an artist space gallery. And uh, I had made 73 masks that were ex cast expressions of my face. And I did sound and movement um, pieces based on them. Um, it was important to me at the time that this be in a gallery, not a theater. I never thought my work would be in a theater. Oh, I should go back and tell you about the map, that there were two large rectangular shapes. And one was the public theater, and one was La Mama. And I, at that time, I had nothing to do with those two spaces. My interest did not lie in going to find out what was at the public theater or what was at La Mama. Eventually, a couple of decades later, of course I did, but at the time, I wasn't interested. So I began to make um, autobiographical pieces. Um, I made pieces in which the objects were the focus, and the other elements of the performance were built around them. These performances were about the conflict of growing up as an artistic girl in a traditional strict Greek home, and the tension between Greek and American culture, and the myths and everyday realities of my life. Uh, I performed not as an actor, but I always kind of thought of myself as a stagehand that was performing, doing certain tasks on stage. And I often thought I was invisible. Um, I, but I was interested in animating objects. And many of these were objects that I would place on my body. And then, um, you know, you'll have these periods where something kind of shifts in a major way. And in my studio had been a series of uh, three foot high realistic self-portraits. There must have been 30 of them in my studio lined up against the wall. And one day, I took one of these dolls and I took a saw and I chopped off the arm at the shoulder and then I put, I stitched loosely the shoulder and the arm together and then I did the same thing at the elbow. And then I, I put a hole in the hand and I put a string up to the ceiling and across the wall and I realized that I had this animated figure that looked just like me that could move a little bit. And that's how I sort of stumbled onto puppetry. I had never been interested in puppets. I didn't even call these puppets. I, I called them, you know, Theodore dolls. So um, this uh, opened the door to a lot of, um, a lot of performances where um, this self-portrait became the, the performer. And in the early works, um, there were miniature stages on wheels and I would stand behind them and I would do the voices and I would move the strings. Um, and whether the characters were male or female or animals, they always began with my self-portrait and then I would sort of manipulate them and change them into other kind of characters. Um, I discovered something about puppets in this process. And I began to feel that puppets were capable of telling the truth unlike many human actors could. And I began to see them as innocent and neutral and pure, something pure about them. So at the same time as that, I was interested in documentary material, real things that happened, things you read in the newspaper, um, historical things. And that's how the connection came up for me that's been, that was a pretty long-standing connection between documentary material and, um, and puppets. So this was, these two images are from a piece called Micropolis, which means tiny village. And I think that as I look back on them now, they were kind of stories, usually violent urban stories that I had found reading the newspaper or 
either in New York City or, or just in other cities. And so there were these concentrated little scenes of violence. And I, I also began to understand that um, an audience could um, watch a puppet bleed to death or vomit. And it was very different from how you would imagine an actor performing that or pretending to perform that. So um, these puppets really engaged me for several years. Um, this is um, the beginning of a large works that I made. Um, Bonnie had mentioned The Age of Invention where there were 300 puppets and it was a, a big sort of three-part story of American invention, the glorious side and the dark side, the critical side. The next piece I made was the history of eugenics, the kind of the bright side of science and the really shady side of science. And this was, for example, Charles Darwin introducing all the phyla of, the, of life uh, in front of a periodic table of the elements. One of my largest pieces was called The Radiant City, and it was about a master builder named Robert Moses, who more than really anyone we can think of shaped the modern American city. Um, in a lot of bad ways, actually, by ripping up neighborhoods and um, favoring highways and roadways over every, every other kind of public uh, forum. So in this scene, Robert Moses, who is a huge 13-foot um, on his side puppet, um, is later in life, he's no longer uh, loved by the public. He's actually hated by the public because he destroyed so many neighborhoods. So it's a restless Robert Moses asleep, or dreaming, and the people who uh, he displaced are, are haunting him. Um, this was a piece called Underground, and it was, again, a smaller piece with small stages. And these were um, people who live, work, and hide underground. And again, it was, uh, most of it was documentary material. This was um, a remake of a photo from Life magazine, I think in 1961, of a family who built the complete perfect bomb shelter for themselves. This piece is important to me because it's the first piece I did at La Mama, which was in 1992. And um, I continued to perform at La Mama continuously, really every year up until the present day. So really, I've done 20 works there. And you have to say that it's very lucky to have a place that you can call your artistic home. And I really have had it. Of course, we know that Ellen's not with us anymore. But, but it's, been, it's been pretty great to have that. Uh, one of the um, environmental pieces that Bonnie spoke about, the history of medicine under the knife, took place in um, 12 different spaces of La Mama. And it began, the audience um, opened the doors of this giant goddess of medicine, Medusa. She was, uh, I think, 13 feet high. And the doors opened, you went up the steps, and you began your journey. This is one of the scenes from um, Under the Knife, um, a medieval birth based on astrology. The piece after that was a history of women in prison, again, done all over the theater. It was called Body of Crime. And um, another um, a kind of sideshow of criminal women. There were many theories about um, women inherently being criminal and it being traced to their, their sexual organs. There was uh, actually a lot of um, scientific writing on the subject. I'm always very interested in scientific writing that isn't really authentic, that's just kind of created and sort of um, goes under the radar and is actually very dangerous. And then um, I went to India for six months and my work changed completely. Um, it took a while. It didn't happen overnight. But suddenly, I wasn't as interested in documentary material and puppets anymore. And I was so moved by the really passionate 
storytelling forms that existed in India in every art form, dance, puppetry, singing, theater. And when you get a culture that's so ancient and unbroken in its tradition, I think I was seeing work that was 4,000 years old. Um, I really got interested in storytelling, which I had always sort of never, never cared about, but there were so many layers and so many varieties of storytelling in the performing arts that um, it, it really moved me and really had an effect, I would say, for the last 10 years of my life. So um, at first, I went back to Greek myths and, and legends and um, found that um, the puppets I made could be very fanciful and were sort of great um, players in, in, in mythology and fantasy. So for example, this is a moment from the birth of Helen of Troy. She was half mortal, half human, and um, mythologies, certain mythologies describe her as being born out of an egg. Um, at that time, I was experimenting with a puppet form that I really love called Humanettes which is um, you make a small puppet body and you tie it up against your neck and you use your own face. And it's not used very often. I think um, Charles Ludlam used humanettes once in a while, but I haven't seen it used very much. I, I think it's just a great form. Um, a moment from um, the 1200 ships um, gathering uh, on the shore before the, the Trojan War begins. And then a very large um, shadow screen, 28 feet across, um, showing um, one, one moment from the war, one day in the war with shadow puppets. So I was, using, I was using a lot of fragments in a sort of collaged way to make up a story, and I was also using a lot of different kinds of puppets. And that seemed to, su they seemed to suit each other, that sort of hybrid and hybrid. Um, Helen and her double. There's a version of, of Helen of Troy, the story by, by Euripides. There's a play where um, Helen doesn't actually go to war, but Hera takes a cloud and creates a perfect replicant of Helen and sends that to war and leaves the real Helen hidden in Egypt. So this is Helen and her double. And then I, I um, worked with ideas from the Odyssey using, again, shadow theater. And um, for example, this is, again, a kind of hybrid mask puppet. It's when Odysseus goes to the underworld and he visits five different um, characters from his life. And um, they have um, a, a kind of a welding helmet with, um, with a video screen on their um, on their face, and that's how they communicate with, with their eyes. Um, a moment from the childhood of, of Odysseus, um, and Odysseus finally being discovered by his nurse. She find, she's washing the, the stranger who's um, hungry and dirty, and um, she sees the scar that she remembered, that he, uh, his injury when he was a boy. Um, so next, I did a production of Iphigenia. It's actually the first play I ever directed. I've always created my own um, texts, but this time I was um, commissioned to work in uh, Minneapolis with a theater company that takes uh, plays um, with costumes but no set right into prisons, and they perform for many of the prison, different prisons in Minnesota. So I chose Iphigenia because it was really about the eve of the Trojan War and the sacrifice Agamemnon makes. He sacrifices his daughter in order to gain um, wins to allow the men to sail for war. And that required um, a new kind of puppet. I was looking at a, a play for the first time, and I realized that I wasn't going to be able to work with the puppeteers that I usually worked with. Suddenly, I really needed to work with good actors, but also actors who could move well and actors who weren't threatened by performing with a puppet. Because 
occasionally there is there will be a kind of actor who um, doesn't really want to share the <laughs> the sort of the energy with the puppet. Um, so I created a life-size puppet. It's actually very almost life-size. I'll show her later. She's sitting over there. And um, one actor uh, connects to the puppet at four different points in their body. And it's based on um, a female form of bunraku in Japan. It's not a very popular form, but, but it does exist. It's actually, um, it was kind of created in the 1930s. It's not a really old form. It was created because bunraku wasn't that popular anymore, and people thought, well, if we put a few pretty faces out there and give them their own puppet, maybe people will come back to the Bunraku Theater. But it's, it's kind of a wonderful style, and you'll see in the clips that you're, um, you really are able to kind of coexist quite closely with this puppet. These are scenes. Oh, and the great thing about Greek plays was that you can play with the chorus. You can do really fun things with with your interpretation of the chorus. In this case, I made multiples. I, I, didn't, I couldn't have a lot of actors. It was a traveling show. So um, I actually multiplied the chorus and um, had something like 12 people, but only one of them was a real performer. <laughs> These are some more um, productions um, with those life-size puppets. Again, with Medea, I was um, experimenting with the chorus, and I decided to make them three. The chorus are these sort of chatty, petty, jealous Corinthian women, and I decided to make them as gigantic mask figures. So one of my most recent and one of my favorites um, was a, a piece based on the Trojan women. And I remember when I was reading Trojan women, I just couldn't get past the static nature of the four characters and their four kind of monologues. And f one day I just remember reading about um, a really bold and very, very funny, courageous woman named Jenny Williams in Zimbabwe. And I think it was a New York Times article talked about what a how how hard it had been for her to to fight the regime in Zimbabwe, and that she was um, constantly joking and you know really confronting the um, the police and the authorities. She had been arrested 33 times. She really couldn't. She had to sleep in safe houses, but she had a great sense of humor. So I sort of kept that article about Jenny Williams, and then I began to find a few more activists who I, I think were these incredible parallels to the four Trojan women, Helen, Cassandra, Andromache, and uh, Hecuba. So um, I began to line them up, and I, I thought of doing something very, very large scale, and I thought I would make Hecuba and Helen and all the Trojan women really enormous. And then the other, uh, the current activists would be life-size, and then that just didn't work for me. And one day I was in my studio and I thought, oh my god, it has to be the reverse, because those um, present-day activists are so much more, to me, right now, ferocious and fighting and amazing and heroic. So that's what I did. I made um, four giant um, figures, and they actually had um, the Trojan women life-size inside of their skirts. So they, it was kind of a traveling show, and um, Jenny Williams, for example, her skirt would open, and rolling out would come Hecuba performing a scene from Trojan women. So it was a, a play within a play. That's when I learned that I could use scale as a playwriting tool. I mean, scale is scale. I mean, scale to a designer is, is everything, but I never knew I could use it as a playwriting tool because suddenly these women in Zimbabwe and Afghanistan and Kenya, who I wanted so much to be important in this production, 
by virtue of their sheer scale, were just incredibly heroic and just what I wanted them to be. I did a production of Lysistrata where I experimented with um, the chorus again. I would take one human being and then they would have a steel rig to the right and to the left of them and there'd be a life-size puppet. So in that scene that you see, it looks like there's a million people there, but one third of them are people and the rest are puppets. My last piece that I did in April, Prometheus Within. Um, the chorus is um, Daughters of Ocean, and I turned them into these singing swans and worked with um, a group of singers and um, a composer named Skip Shirey that I've been working with. And this piece was about lining up Prometheus and his, um, his um, daring to explore knowledge and science to pair it with a lot of the work that's going on in genetic engineering right now. Um, this is a scene from Prometheus Within. Um, and these people have actually come back from the dead and they're um, looking over an operating room because in fact these three people had cells stolen from them and once the cells left their body without their knowledge um, entrepreneurs um, use those cells to, to become, in some cases, m millionaires. There was a book called um, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it, but it's a story about um, how your own cells, once they leave your body, no longer belong to you. Okay, that's all for now. And what I'd like to do is um, show you s three short clips of, of work in, in a DVD form and then um, I'll take questions. So um, I was working with a scroll painter who told the story of Helen of Troy in Bengali image and language. So Helen of Troy was born of a rape. Her mother was a mortal and Zeus disguised as a swan um, lusted after her. This is the birth of Helen. We could probably turn the lights out now, couldn't we? So these are the humanists that I was humanists that I was telling you about. So basically, from the minute she was born, Helen was absolutely irresistible, and the little boys in the neighborhood all come out to see who she is.
So when she's a very young child, she's actually kidnapped by Theseus. So this is the beauty contest that actually starts the Trojan War, and Athena and Hera and Aphrodite ask Paris who's the most beautiful. So these were puppets that were um, projections on a curtain. Three 20-foot high curtains drop, and the puppeteers have small projectors that they uh, project onto the curtain. That's Hera, that's Athena. It's a really very low tech projection, but it, it worked fine. <laughs> And again, because I did the first version of this in India, these are Indian actresses, and they were really fun. They were wonderful to work with. That's Aphrodite. That's Zeus. So this is how tall Paris is. That gives you a sense of the scale. So between the moving features on the video and the moving um, curtains that a puppeteer would move, you got a lot of life out of them. Therefore, Aphrodite wins, and Hera and Athena are furious and will plot against her. Oh, so this is another kind of puppet. It's, I, I just made it up. It's called a pillow puppet. And I took, um, I took uh, pillows and sheets and it's a story of Zeus and Hera, husband and wife, fighting. And they're fighting about who has more fun in sex, men or women. And Hera has asked Tiresias, who's been both man and woman, and he said, women by nine times have a better sex life than men. So this is a scene where Agamemnon and his brother Menelaus sit at the shore and gather the 1,200 ships as they get ready to sail for war.
So in order to represent the Aegean, I used um, Ziploc bags and I filled them with um, blue water. And eventually hundreds of these um, bags kind of appear on the stage. So this is the very large shadow screen, 28 feet across. And to the left of the shadow screen are the gods who are looking down on this moment of battle the w and rooting for their favorites the way you would at a good football game. And I just took one page out of the Iliad from Dawn to dark that describes what happens, and I made a shadow piece out of it. Shadow puppetry really takes a lot of people to perform it. Something like eight people were needed to perform that. This is a fragment from the, um, the Odyssey where um, the Trojan horse has snuck into the gates of Troy and out of perversity, Helen comes downstairs in the middle of the night knowing the Greek men are in there and she imitates their wives' voices and they go crazy inside and they almost give themselves away.
So uh, the war is over, and Helen's double doesn't need to exist anymore. So she sort of self-destructs. So many Greeks and Trojans build out their lives for me, all for nothing. So Helen was simply an excuse to go to war to plunder Troy. And Helen was simply a creation. So there were two people inside that puppet, and one has left. And soon, it's going to just disintegrate into a, a heap of cloth. For she was truly innocent. So I think. Um, the bits and pieces of myths about Helen of Troy were a way for me to construct something that was playful and also had its dark moments, too. And there was just a lot of freedom in that. Um, Okay, so that's one of the clips. What's that? Do you want to talk about it a little bit or just go to the second one? Oh. Um, I, I guess we can just wait if you have questions. We can just wait till we see um, the other two clips. Is that all right? Okay. So um, the next one is um, Iphigenia which, as I told you, was the Euripides play, and it was actually the first time that I wrestled with a play. Memnon has a curse because he had been hunting one day and he had killed a sacred deer. Uh, uh, Agamemnon had a curse because when he was hunting one day, he killed a sacred deer that belonged to Artemis. And that begins the cycle of um, curses and revenges. All right, so this is the chorus. These are the young girls um, in the town where the, um, the uh, fleet has settled. So it was originally designed to be a very mobile production with no set, and that's why I had done certain economies, like one person being this chorus of several people. I basically took a hula hoop and multiplied the, um, the bus, you know, five times and, and then uh, built the structure. 
And then one other person would manipulate the mouth and the, um, the other. So even though this is a dark tragedy, there's also uh, playful elements to it as well. I think because of, of the puppetry. I decided that Iphigenia was the one character who was utterly innocent. So as a child, I had her have a small puppet, but she did not present the same puppet that every other character presented. This is another humanette. It's Nikki Pariza.
this was a moment, um, we were working with lines of the chorus, and it seemed a moment that I could actually have Clytemnestra step outside of her role and take her veil off and represent the chorus in a way. Actually, um, we could stop this um, short here. I want to make sure I have enough time to answer questions. The actual um, murder of um, Iphigenia is, as you know, done off, done off stage. All the violent actions in Greek theater are done off stage. And I had chosen a shadow theater for the messenger speech. OK, so there's one more now. Okay, we'll do we'll do the other one later, the other clip. For some reason, we can't hear it well. We can't hear it well, right? So the child has been thrown from, the child has been killed. Odysseus has thrown him over the ramparts, and Hecuba's mourning his death. So that's the same actress four years later that did Iphigenia, Carolyn Gelser. This is the, toward the end of the play when their fate is sealed. They've been assigned as slaves, and they know they're leaving very quickly. That's Jenny Williams, the um, giant from Zimbabwe.
So you can see that those were the four giants, and through their skirts would come the um, life-size characters. Okay, that's okay. We don't have to see the other part. I think it's fine. We can just... Um, so, does anyone have questions? exceptional moments. Uh, normally, the puppeteers are all veiled but, uh, for, the, for the group ones. But there were two moments, one for um, Clytemnestra and one for Hecuba, where I, I felt that they could um, unveil and, and actually interact differently with the character and with the audience. As a rule, with that style of puppet, I, I usually kept the performers veiled. Puppets or sorry, do you still make all of your own puppets or does you know, someone else I, help you? Um, I work with one other assistant for years now, for like 20 years, and she's also a really great puppeteer in her own right, Kathy Shaw. So Kathy and I together make these puppets in my house, in my in my loft. And you're still in the same one, in the same yeah. loft. That's great. <laughs> Um, why Greek mythology? Like, why? Uh, I just want to know, like, why you're, why that's like one of your interests, and like, um, you know, um, I never thought I would deal with Greek subject matter, um, and you know, I sort of left it in my childhood. And then when I was in India, uh, the tradition of storytelling was so rich, and so emotional that it kind of led me back to Greek myths, and that's been a, a pretty much a 10-year period of my work. I think I've left it now. I think I'm sort of interested in other things. I'm interested, actually, in UNESCO right now, um, and, um, and some of his plays, like, for me, the chairs are like a chorus. I'm sort of playing with that, but, but anyway, it came, it came out of my, my months in India. And it took a while for me to recognize it. I mean, I can look back now and see it, but. Hi. Hi. I don't think this is on. Um, it's not really on. Um, when you start off um, with the production, do you have sort of an idea of the types of puppets you're going to use? Or do you sort of, as you go, think about what you need them to accomplish and then choose sort of Yeah. Appropriate it goes in cycles. I think I went through a cycle where I was using the puppets like this. And I'm not so um, interested in them right now. So I didn't use them in my last show, Prometheus. Um, so um, it comes in waves, and maybe it'll be for four or five shows, and then, and then uh, I'll put them aside. Yeah. But, I, but what did happen was that I became much more interested in actors. And before the, that period of time, I, I worked with a core of really great puppeteers who were not at all actors. So as a result, I only work with a few of them now, and I, I work with different people now. Yeah. Um, I really like your screenplay. I can't hear you. I really like the screenplay and the music, and I'm wondering if you um, conceived that, uh, like, did that whole thing as well, or like just the, the speaking? Okay, um, sorry. I really like um, the screenplay and the music, and I'm wondering if that was like that was all you as well. Oh no, the music is not at all. I think my most important collaborations have been with composers, and I've worked with some really great composers. Um, the last four years, I've been working with a guy named Skip Shirey, who's great. He was um, he worked with a circus for a long time. He was a circus composer. And I found him when I was doing um, the traveling players because I wanted to um, I wanted to work with some circus music, but most of the circus music I found online was just horrible. <laughs> so I, you know, have you ever done really crazy googling? So one day I googled circus music giant skirts because of the giant puppets, 
and his name came up. <laughs> and, and I got together with him, and we're like soulmates. We're born on the same day. His name is Skip because he's half Albanian, and Skip a Terrace means the country of Albania. I mean, we, we're really, we're, we're so, we're like soulmates. So it's a really important collaboration, and that's how I found him. <laughs> We have a question from one of our live stream viewers. So Timor, or Tamor, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, asks, besides the aforementioned Western puppetry and Indian shadow puppetry, have you explored any other puppetry cultures? Oh, let's see. Water puppets in Vietnam, which are a really uh, wild kind of form, um, I only I only I worked with a puppet company, but I, I I would never attempt to make anything like that. Yeah. Um, what else? What other kinds? Well, there's so many different kinds in India, but I didn't I wasn't moved to make them. I don't make shadow puppets very much anymore either. So just go in and out of forms, I suppose. Um, I was wondering if you could talk more about uh, why Ionesco is relevant to you and what you <laughs> plan to do with his work. I, I don't know why these things happen. Sometimes, I know why, because sometimes it's 11.59 and at midnight a grant is due and you don't have an idea and you just let your mind wander or look at a book on the bookshelf or something and somehow it turns out to be something that six months later you're interested in. That happened with UNESCO, I guess. I don't know. But, but, uh, but I'm interested in him. I think he's wonderful, but I think it's really hard to do theater of the absurd right now. I haven't figured that out yet, except great concept. It's going to be, you know, there are 35 chairs in it. These are going to be handmade, individualized puppet chairs with a puppeteer inside each one, or outside, manipulating one. So that's already a big change. And I won't use his script. I'll just use his storyline. Why, are you interested in UNESCO? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, oh, hi. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure I have anything insightful to say other than I, I really love absurdism and think it's important, yeah. Do you write your scripts while you're putting the show together, or do you write them before and then put the show together? I still think I use the word collage them together. I assemble them. And I usually assemble them primarily before rehearsal. But you know, when, when you're working in this sort of the downtown uh, non-commercial theater, your rehearsal periods are so painfully short that you can't do really heavy duty experimenting in three week period at night yeah. when everyone else works it in the daytime. So you try and prepare. I think most people, would, most directors would tell you this. You try and prepare as much as you can. So most of it, and then sometimes, of course, major things happen during the course of a very short rehearsal period. Yeah. I have a quick question. I, I just, uh, I'm curious, uh, just reflecting on on the decades you've been working. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the on creativity and the creative process? I mean, how, how has yours evolved and wh what are your reflections on that? Well, I, I do think that uh, because I am a certain way because of you know, where I landed as a young artist you know, at 21 or something. I think, I think that's, that's definitely true. I think that I'm, my creative process is such that I can only really work on one, one thing at a time. And um, uh, I think I, I made certain deals with myself about um, being able to work freely and independently and really never having enough of a budget and never having enough of a rehearsal time. But I, you know, you get to trust your own process. My process is slow. Um, sometimes I don't go as deep as I used to be able to go, and that's really a shame because I think it shows in the work sometimes. But um, 
I need to think alone a lot, and then um, the making in the studio is a really, really important part of it, and a great pleasure, really. When I'm not in the studio for a few days, I really just feel bad. You know, it's always a really happy time to go in there and make something with my hands, you know? So, um, yeah. I can't imagine having worked anywhere else besides New York. I think that was a really happy decision for me to just stay here, even though, oh, there was that period of time. There was that period of time in the 70s and 80s when so many of us were being commissioned to go to Europe to make pieces and tour them and then bring them back and show them in New York. And there were so many times you were tempted well, why couldn't I live in Amsterdam? Why couldn't I live in Belgium? Why couldn't I live in Germany? And somehow, most of us decided to come back to New York. But that, plus that changed. We would be suffering over there now too, so, yeah. I was just wondering how long you worked as a waitress. <laughs> 12 years. Was that the same place? No. <laughs> <laughs> but you can really make a lot of money as a waitress, and it doesn't affect the rest of your mind. For example, teaching, which I do at Pratt, um, teaching can very often use up a lot of parts of your brain that um, I didn't use when I was a waitress. <laughs> we have one more question from our live viewer, live stream viewers. Natasia Green asks, how do you choose to apply color to your productions, and do you consider how the colors you choose will resonate with the spectator? Oh, God, that's such a great, uh, that's such a really great thing to think about, isn't it? Um, I don't think I consciously choose colors that way. I think, um, I think form and structure is more important to me, but I'm, I'm usually pretty happy with a color palette that comes out. For example, I think in Iphigenia, you really are surrounded by, by the Aegean, by Aegean blue somehow. Um, I don't know if I think about color so, so consciously or that I could uh, articulate it really well. I don't know. Um, can you talk about your relationship with India and that first trip that you made yeah. and what's the, what that's meant for storytelling? For yeah, you? it was just it was just eye opening to be there and is, I, I made sure that I saw so many traditional forms and I didn't really see many contemporary forms. I I've gone back several times and I've gone to other places. For example, Calcutta has a really lively contemporary theater scene. But most of the other regions where I spent time were the traditional plays, you know, that they would be all night performances, Kathakali or shadow puppetry or something. And you can still find that in India. The big change for me now, it's 12 years later and I've gone back several times, India's economy has just, just exploded. So suddenly, uh, I go to a puppet festival that um, I know from its start, it's in its 12th year, and it's just becoming very sophisticated and very um, big budget, and it's, it's huge audiences. It's sort of amazing to see that culture change. So right now, traditional and contemporary, traditional and cutting edge, they're living side by side, but they won't for long, so I would say, go now. You know. Thank <laughs> you.